Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth of our Science Week lecture series for 2008. Discover Science and Engineering, in association with the Science Gallery, are bringing together some leading speakers during Science Week to share their experiences of science and technology with you all. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Stephen Attenborough, who's Commercial Director for Virgin Galactic, which is on track to become the world's first passenger-carrying commercial space line. So uh, I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing what he has to tell us. Uh, our MC for this evening is Liz Bonin, and Liz started her career presenting on RT television, and then she moved to the UK to present a number of uh, uh, programmes on, for different TV channels. Um, and she's a regular presenter on Top of the Pops, and a number of programmes for Living TV. Really? And most recently, she presented the Science Friction program on uh, RTE. So I'll hand you over to Liz now. Very sorry to say that Top of the Pops is no longer with us, but uh, yeah, it was good fun at the time. <laughs> uh, it's very nice to see all of you. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of Discover Science and Engineering um, for a very special lecture in this Science Week series. Now, this uh, evening's subject is space travel. Now, I don't know about you, but it's definitely not something I thought I could be able to do in my lifetime, but it has definitely become a reality. Now, Virgin Galactic is uh, wholly owned by Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Group and is the world's first passenger-carrying commercial space liner, promising people like you and me uh, the ultimate entertainment experience. Now, our guest speaker this evening is Virgin Galactic's commercial director, responsible not only for selling the seats, but also for managing the entire space-going experience, from the training all the way to landing back on terra firma in one piece. It's my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Stephen Attenborough. Thank you, uh, thank you, Liz. And uh, I've never been on stage with somebody who's presented Top of the Pops before, so it's, uh, you know... That's a first and a great privilege. Uh, so anyway, great to be here tonight. Thanks for turning out on a cold Dublin night. And uh, I think we've got some quite exciting things to tell you and to show you this evening. My life changed quite dramatically, actually, in 2004. Um, I had been working in a much duller industry for most of my career before that. And uh, I was actually between jobs and uh, was standing, at, uh, funnily enough, at the top of a ladder um, doing some painting of a, a little house we have. And... Uh, the phone rang and I got it out of my pocket and answered it and it was, uh, it was Richard Branson, which is a really bad thing to happen when you're at the top of a ladder because your, your natural inclination is to take a step back. But um, he, uh, anyway, he, he, he said after a little bit that, um, uh, that Virgin was about to start a new business and they'd like to talk to me about possibly playing a role in that. And so uh, I said, well, that's a, you know, very flattering and, and uh, I would love to talk about it. What, what is it? And he said, well... Uh, we're planning to, take, uh, to start the world's first space line and, and take uh, thousands of people into space. And, uh, and I, I went a little quiet at that, really, because um, I don't know if you're aware of the old adage that uh, if you want to, the best way to become a, a millionaire uh, is to become a billionaire and then start an airline. And, uh, and I thought, well, if that's the case with a, a, an airline, you know, it's, it's certainly going to be the case with a space line, I would have thought. But then I thought, well, here's a guy that has started several airlines, and uh, he still seems to be a billionaire, so maybe this is the person to do it. And the more I knew, got to know about the project, the more I felt that this was a fantastically exciting opportunity, personally, uh, but also a very important project, and one that had a unique set of, of, uh, of, of, of criteria, I suppose, which which made me believe, and, uh, and, I, and I believe that even more now, that we have a unique opportunity to really change things for the better. So um, tonight I want to take you through a presentation, uh, and I also want to, to play you uh, a few DVDs. This is a, this is a very visually rich project. Uh, you get very bored, I think, to, to hear me just speaking for an hour. So um, I want to kick off, actually, to give you a bit of an introduction to this project, to hear from the man himself who's paying for it. Um, and to give you a little bit of a flavor for what we're up to, and then I'll sort of go back and tell you the context of what we're doing in a bit more detail. So uh, without further ado, maybe we could just play the first, the first bit of film. I absolutely have to develop a manned space tourism system that's at least getting Space is absolutely crucial. It's our communications, it's our logistics movement. And part of something that history is everything. Space is everything. 
Bridge of the Great Rhine. He's just an incredible entrepreneur and a very This will be a trip like no other. It will give those that travel with us a unique and life-changing perspective of our planet. For most of us, escaping the constraints of gravity is something we've only been able to achieve in our dreams until now. Virgin Galactic is now on the final stretch for coming the world's first commercial space line. Our suborbital space trips promise to be the most intense and wonderful experiences that our passengers have ever had. We, and I hope you, will be traveling on a spaceship owned and operated by Virgin Galactic. Our spacecraft have been designed so that each of our passengers will have the room and the freedom to enjoy the amazing sensation of weightlessness. Large panoramic windows will allow you to see clearly the curved earth over 100 kilometers below and the colors of the fragile atmosphere protecting our vulnerable planet. It will also be at the heart of our ability to offer a breathtaking journey in an environment which will be as safe as we can possibly make it and of course in the style that Virgin is so rightly recognized for. We have spent many years on a frankly fairly futile search for technology that could be developed into a vehicle which would meet our specifications for safety, environmental impact, and commercial viability, and of course the potential for a great customer experience. But Brutin's Spaceship One and those flawless history-making X-Prize flights in 2004 suddenly changed all that, and we grabbed the opportunity. We showed that it is feasible for industry to develop and fly manned spacecraft. But the more important thing is that what we did on our program is to develop safety solutions. Spaceship Two has a unique feathering configuration. And what that does, it allows it to re-enter the atmosphere in a carefree fashion. Now what that means is the pilot or a computer doesn't have to perfectly line it up it can come into the atmosphere at any angle and it'll straighten itself out without the pilot having to fly that or without the computer having to do it. It's just that simple. The beauty of BIRD's feathering device on Spaceship Two is that it combines the best features of re-entry using basically the atmosphere of a brake and not having to fly a flight profile with the fact that you can then change the shape the ship at 50,000 feet back into a normal glider and land on a normal runway as people would do in the shed seas environment of a normal aircraft. We're looking at only a three-day training schedule for a flight into space. We will have psychologically attuned you to the greatest ride of your life. Well, the day that Burke won the X-Prize was a hugely significant one for us. I remember chatting to Brian Binney, the pilot of that epic flight. He said it was a journey of contrast describing the enormous forces that pinned him to his seat and the tremendous noise as the spaceship powered out of the atmosphere. Then suddenly, the dramatic and absolute silence of space. The vibrations go away, the shrieking and shrilling noise of that rock motor disappears, and you get this instant karma of weightlessness. Someone's pulled back a uh, stage curtain for your eyes only, this black void that space is a, a mystery, but you, know, you get a sense of its majesty as well. There's this panorama, lights you've never seen, it's majestic. And separating these two extremes is this you know, thin blue electric ribbon of light, that's the atmosphere. You cannot appreciate the experience just by looking at a magazine cover, just what it is like to take it in with your own eyes. And everything you feel in your body is the same way, it's, it's wow. Since the announcement in 2004, the project has reached and passed many important milestones. We have a truly inspiring design for our home at Spaceport America in New Mexico. An ever-increasing family of pioneering customers. And of course, beautiful new vehicles, now in an extensive test program before they start commercial service. Our first Virgin Galactic astronauts are booking their own place in history as pioneers of a new space age 
and for them the journey has already started. Being part of this club is a great learning experience, you're meeting great people, you're, you're really contributing to something very different. From doing the events with uh, Richard in the Caribbean to New York to LA, it's just been a whole exciting, entirely amazing experience. I've gotten to meet people from all over the world, uh, people in all types of occupations and all different backgrounds from which they had a desire to go into space. Like many of our fellow future astronauts, I've already completed my centrifuge experience with my son. It was an incredible ride, a great preparation, but really brought home to us just how awe-inspiring it would be at that moment when the Virgin spaceship is released from the Virgin Mothership and starts its supersonic climb to space. Virgin Galactic will be using clean and safe technology, technology that is many thousands of times more environmentally friendly than any previous manned space vehicle. Already, Virgin Galactic's carrier aircraft, White Knight 2, is the world's largest all-carbon composite aircraft. With the end of the oil era approaching and climate change progressing faster than most models have been predicting, safer, cheaper and more flexible access to space is essential. Access to space really does matter for the future of mankind. And currently, we only have 50-year-old space systems to get there which are very expensive and very environmentally damaging. But if we can get robust, safe, and more importantly, environmentally benign and very cheap access to space, we can do things up there that were never imagined a few years ago. Well, I hope you will be as excited and inspired by Virgin Galactic's mission as I am. And see you up there. Well, I hope that gives a, a little taste of what we're up to. And what I'd like to do now is take a step back. And um, one of the things that uh, certainly crossed my mind when I first started at Galactic is, you know, why, why would any company want to do this? I mean, going to space is notoriously risky. It's notoriously expensive. Uh, things tend to go wrong. And, uh, you know, I think to understand the context of why we're doing this, you have, it's useful just to understand a little bit about the way that the Virgin operates. Uh, we have about 200 companies now in the group turnover of about 20 billion, about 40,000 people work now for a, uh, for a Virgin company and uh, you know from vodka to, to airlines and it's a very entrepreneurial structure and um, I think that Richard tends to start companies and to, to promote companies where he feels that uh, there is either a cartel in operation or that the public are just not being well served. Now he was a kid from the 60s and uh, I suspect there are one or two other kids from the 60s here tonight who remember what a fantastic decade that was in terms of, of development of, of, of access to space. You know, we started in the late 50s where really nothing man-made had been to space at all and we finished the 1960s with two men st stepping onto the moon. Uh, it was a very extraordinary decade. And those kids that grew up in the 60s, including Richard, and others, you know, their, their parents were telling them at the time that, that they'd be going to space on a regular basis by 1978, you know, and they were looking forward to that, and it didn't happen. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about the reasons it didn't happen in a moment, but um, that is a very natural sort of business area for Virgin to get involved in, where there's demand, uh, which is not being met because for whatever reason, uh, the public is not being able to get its hands on a service. So I think it sort of fitted in quite well as, as far as that was concerned. And um, Virgin, of course, is also the, the, uh, the, the, the story of a, of, of a man. And, uh, and it, the way that Richard tends to do business, and certainly did business with Galactic, is to announce early. And in fact, Virgin Galactic was actually uh, registered as a business back in the late 90s. And uh, Richard announced one day, probably to the surprise of most people, that, uh, that Virgin was going to take people to space uh, within a decade. And uh, I think we're just about going to make that, actually. At the time, he had no idea how, uh, how he was going to do it, um, but decided it would be a good thing to do, and it ought to be possible, uh, considering that uh, people have been going to space for sort of 45 years. Um, so to commercialize that seemed to him to be an obvious thing to do, and uh, it was really about time that somebody got hold of this and, uh, and opened it for, the, for the, the desires and wishes of ordinary people around the world. 
It also fitted very nicely into a, uh, into a business or an investment ethos that we developed at Virgin at the, uh, the beginning of this century. And I just want to talk a little bit about that because it's very important, I think, to understand why we're doing this project for the longer term. We want to give people a fantastic experience. It's very important that those people have signed up early in order to support the development program. But we have a longer term aim here. And it comes down to, a, uh, as I say, an ethos or, or a philosophy which we've developed and we apply to, to, to most of the investments that we make within the group now. A lot of our businesses are involved in transportation. Transportation takes energy. Most of that energy at the moment comes from fossil fuels. And it became very evident to us, uh, I guess, sort of nine or ten years ago, that the impact of peak oil, whenever that happens, and to human-induced climate change was going to be a future key driver of company financial performance. And within this, uh, this, this paradigm, there were going to clearly be losers and winners. In, in our view, the losers would be the people that really looked on this issue as a, as a marketing thing that just needed, you needed to tick the right boxes, maybe do a little bit of carbon offset or whatever. But the winners in this, uh, this new environment would be those companies that really grabbed hold of this as a, as a serious issue, but also a serious opportunity, and became the carbon efficient, carbon efficient sector mold breakers. And we obviously wanted to be in the winning category. And our belief is that... Uh, with oil, um, this figure keeps changing every time I do presentations, but let's assume that uh, lo longer term that oil is going to be you know, at least $100 a barrel, um, that in, in that sort of environment this is going to become an industrial survival issue. And so we look at this, you know, we look at climate change, we look at the challenges that, that, that come from, from peak oil, the rising cost of energy, as in, in very commercial terms, and we believe there are huge opportunities there, uh, both to do some good and to continue to be a, a winning company in the future. And let me give you an example of the sort of, the sort of thing that we've done uh, bef before I then put it in the context of the space business. This rather beautiful aeroplane uh, was built by a guy called Bert Rattan, who you saw on the film and we'll be hearing a lot more about in the next few minutes. Um, and it was called the, the, the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. Uh, and it was built for a particular purpose. Uh, it was built so that Steve Fawcett, uh, who sadly died last year, uh, could, could break a record. He wanted to fly, be the first guy to fly solo around the world, a single circumnavigation on a single tank of fuel, non-stop, on his own, uh, which was a pretty crazy thing to want to do, but he wanted to do it nevertheless, and Bert Rattan reckoned he could build him an aircraft that would do it. Virgin Atlantic wanted to get involved, or the Virgin Group wanted to get involved and paid for half of this project, because we wanted to show as an airline operator that there were better ways of running aircraft, more fuel-efficient ways of, 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 uh, of, of building and running aircraft, particularly using carbon composite materials. And this aircraft was, was entirely made out of carbon fiber, which made it very light, very strong, and very fuel-efficient. And our purpose behind that was to say that to the Boeings and the Airbuses of this world, look, you know, as Virgin Atlantic, if we're going to continue to buy your aircraft in the future, you need to take note of this, because we're going to be buying those, those aircraft which are the most fuel efficient, because this is going to be a big issue in the future. And as a result of this project, it was successful, of course, Steve Fawcett managed to get right around the world. It was a remarkable achievement uh, and a very beautiful aircraft. As a result of that uh, and, 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 other, and other projects, you have Boeing now, for example, uh, in advanced stages of the 787 Dreamliner, which is a 50% carbon composite aircraft. Uh, it's 30% more fuel efficient than anything else in its class, and we are the launch customers of that aircraft uh, because you know, we, we want the best that's out there in order to continue to do what we do, but in a better way. And at the same time, we're also working with GE, the manu engine manufacturers of the 787, uh, to develop and to, to flight test um, biofuels. Now, biofuels, of course, are surrounded by a lot of controversy. They're not a silver bullet, but they, they, they do have a future, and we believe they have a future, uh, providing they come from the right sources uh, in, in, uh, in the aviation industry. And we actually flew a 747 from London to Amsterdam with one engine, uh, which was fueled purely by uh, biofuel earlier this year, first time that had been done. So that's the sort of context, the sort of ethos that we're trying to apply across businesses.